Welcome back here at the Exhibition Forum in Hall 3 after the lunch break and thanks for stopping by. We have an afternoon full of information and presentations ahead of us until 6 p.m. And to start with, our first topic today this afternoon is implementing high-end on entry-level microcontrollers. And our speaker is Nicola Santini from ST Microelectronics. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, I will start with a, a fast, a quick survey. Uh, how many of you, just raise your hand, how many of you are already working on a graphical user interface on a microcontroller? Okay, nice. So most, uh, a big third, let's say. Uh, so you are aware that it's not, uh, doing that is not just plugging a display to an existing board, right? It's much more complicated than that. Uh, it requires usually additional memories, either RAM or flash, and it requires also a software stack to manage uh, all the interaction and, uh, and the, the, life, uh, the life cycle of the graphical interface. So I, I'm Nicolas Santini, and today I will uh, give you some tips and some strategy Uh, to approach this uh, high-end uh, graphical user interface on the entry-level microcontrollers. The challenge on entry-level microcontrollers is uh, that we have almost nothing. We will see that. So, uh, first step, I will do a, quite re a quick review of what does it mean to handle uh, an advanced uh, graphical user interface uh, on a microcontroller, high-end or low-end. Uh, to set a common vocabulary, and it also to, to give you the chance to understand exactly what, what, what is the rendering process uh, meaning and how to, to trick it. Then we will focus on the entry-level MCUs and uh, the tricks that we are giving to, uh, to customers uh, in ST Microelectronics uh, to help them uh, implement their graphical interface. And I will then conclude this session. So what does it mean to uh, first What is a high-end uh, graphical user interface? Uh, what makes, what makes, makes it uh, nice? Uh, this is a graphical user interface. Okay, it's functional. It's uh, like a, a home thermostat uh, application. It gives you all the information you need. But, okay, is it what we call an advanced user interface? We do not think so. So what makes uh, a nicer user interface, so this is This is the same information, but in a different way. So with a larger, first, a larger uh, range of colors. Uh, in this case, we have only 16, 16 colors, possible colors. Here we can have a, a, a much larger uh, range of, uh, of colors using uh, 16 bits or 24 bits color depths. An advanced user interface is also non-square graphic elements. Here we have only uh, square elements. Okay, that's, that's functional, but imagine that every day, every morning, every evening and every afternoon, you check the temperature and you see that. Okay, come on. No, prefer, certainly prefer to see something more smooth, more a smartphone-like interface. The bitmap support is also a, a great way to add some texture to, to, to your user interface. Uh, here it's a back, background, a gray background. It's quite dull. Uh, but with, a bit, with some bitmaps, only one for the background, not many bitmaps, but one for the background could, could, could give some, some texture to the user interface and make it more like home. And of course, some, some smooth animations. When you open a menu, uh, you don't just want it to pop up on the screen. You can see some animation uh, opening the menu. So that's not an exhaustive list of uh, what makes an advanced graphical interface, but it's the kind of thing that we have to keep in mind. What is the typical uh, architecture for, uh, for controlling a graphical interface? There's a display, but not only, we will say that, uh, with a regular, let's say, uh, microcontroller. So first, you have the microcontroller itself, of course, and it's connected to a display. So that's the very first step, no display, no graphical user interface. We, let's agree on that. Uh, then you have to saw uh, what we call the assets. The assets is the set of, of bitmaps that you will use in your user interface. For example, for buttons, you, will, you can have two images for one button. And 
uh, these images will be converted uh, into bitmap, and one is for the pressed uh, state, and one is for the real state. So all these, um, these bitmaps need to be stored in a memory that is uh, read-only and persistent. When you restart your device, you don't want, do not want to lose all your assets. So in this case, what we usually do is connect an external flash. You can use, of course, uh, an internal flash if it's sufficient on your microcontroller. But usually, we connect an external flash. And then we have to store the frame buffer. So the frame buffer is, uh, is all the pixel values that you will send constantly to the display so that it shows something. So usually, it's at 60 hertz. You have to send the, uh, a huge amount of RAM to the display so that you see something. So the memory needed for the frame buffer is a read-write area, because you will read it to put it on the display and write to it to update the next frame to be displayed. In this case, we can use, again, the internal RAM of the frame buffer, but usually it's not that big, so we connect an external one. So the process of the rendering we'll see just after is to read from the flash the assets, compose your scene, compose your next frame to be displayed, put it into the frame buffer in RAM, and then the frame buffer is transferred to the display. So that's the typical arch architecture. And keep in mind this, this interface for the next, uh, next, uh, next slide. So it's the usual one with the two circles that are turning. It's a progress, uh, progress circles, let's say. What is the rendering process? The rendering process is the, um, the action of gathering all the bitmaps that compose a, a given screen, uh, gathering all the user interactions that have been processed uh, during, uh, uh, at, at some point, so pressing a button or moving a widget, and prepare the next, the next frame buffer. So we have first the input bitmaps. We have also some shape descriptions. This will be the two, uh, the two circles uh, that we can see uh, moving uh, on our interface. We have the frame buffer, and we have the display and this. So as we saw, the uh, input bitmaps are in flash. The frame buffer is in RAM. And the shape description are not in the core CPU. They are processed by the core CPU at runtime. So here are our background image, some buttons with two states each time for each button, some decorations, and some numbers. They are in two colors, so you have to also store all the, the fonts, all the, the characters that you need to display, uh, all the possible value. I was only displaying 25 or 26, but you can imagine that the temperature can go very high or very low. So you have to store as bitmap all the fonts as well in the, uh, in the flash. And then you have this description. So they are, they are visualized here, but normally it's just okay. Uh, circle information, uh, yellow color, and uh, then compute it at one time. So the first step of the rendering process, after gathering all the information to build the scene, is to update the frame buffer, and finally, transfer to the display. So we have several cases uh, in a microcontroller that embeds a, control, a NetEDC controller, a TFT controller. The frame buffer is constantly sent to the display. But we can see, we, we can see, we will see that it's not possible on an entry-level microcontroller. And keep in mind also that this frame buffer, what does it mean? It means the definition of the screen multiplied by the color depth in kilobytes. So well, for this small screen, I'm talking about a, a screen of this size, uh, it's 150 kilobytes. That of RAM that we will not use for your application. Uh, sorry, the, the graphical user interface, of course. So what about entry-level MCU? What are the constraints of such uh, MCUs? So first, we have a limited RAM. Uh, remember the 150 kilobytes on uh, STM32G0, which is one of uh, STM microelectronics entry-level MCUs. We have only 36 kilobytes of RAM. And you still want, I'm sure, to do something else than displaying uh, uh, your user interface. So it's not possible to use uh, to, to, to store a full frame buffer in the internal one. And on top of that, you have no way to extend uh, this RAM. 
there is no uh, on this device on G0 again. Uh, you have no, no way to, to, to connect an external SDRAM. You may have ways to connect an external flash, no SDRAM. And you need it for the frame buffer. And on top of that, <laughs> the only way you have to connect a display is an SPI interface. And an SPI interface is, uh, is fine for a display that have internal RAM, but uh, can lead to curtain effect. The curtain effect is like it's ex exaggerated here, right? But it means that you can see with your eyes that the screen is updated from top to, to down, or maybe left to right. But you can see it when you change from one screen to another. This is not a nice effect to show uh, on your device. Uh, but, the, the, but the advantage on the other side of this uh, SPI display is that they have their own graphical RAM, so what's called a GRAM. The GRAM is a, a full frame buffer, in fact, inside the display. So it makes the display a bit more expensive. But it allows the display to refresh itself. So when you turn on the display, it automatically reads its internal memory to display what, what's in it. Uh, by default, there is nothing. So that's, that's a very good point, because uh, we have, remember that we have no way to store the frame buffer on the microcontroller. But now I'm telling you that the frame buffer, is, in fact, it, it's already in the display. That's a good point. We just have to send updates of this frame buffer to update the display. And so well, now we will switch to the, what kind of basic rules uh, combined with a smart rendering uh, strategy. So the basic rules will be at the designing of your interface. And the smart rendering will be up to you, but we have some tools that will help you do that. And you do not have to reinvent the wheel on this topic. Believe me, it's, it can take all your development time. So please use what is existing, and we will see that at the end. So for the design uh, recommendation, we have uh, found there is some of them, but it's a general, uh, general idea behind is to reduce as much as possible the pixel processing. Uh, uh, the Cortex-M is not meant for pixel processing. It's a very repetitive task. It's on mathematical computations. It's not meant for that. So reduce uh, the, the pixel processing by first reducing the size of your assets. You can still use some bitmaps. But you can adapt the color. For example, for a bitmap like this, uh, the, does it make sense to use 16-bit color, uh, color format? No, you can use a much reduced uh, format, like a lookup table format, uh, to, to, to store these bitmaps. And it will be converted at one time to be displayed in 16 bits. Uh, it limits also what you can see here, the, 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 the chessboard-like gray and, black and white uh, uh, texture is, means that this area is transparent. Transparency means that when you are rendering your, your frame buffer, you must read the bitmap with a transparent area. You must also read the bitmap that may be behind, the, so the background bitmap. And then combine this, these two and update the frame buffer. So it means that you do three times more processing that if you use a bitmap without transparency. So, I do not say remove bitmap because that's the only way to get a uh, run shaped. But I say do not use bitmap when only use bitmap when it is necessary. And for a, a very example, this very example, this is a button that we have in the previous interface. Uh, these are basically uh, uh, shapes, just shapes, round uh, circles and, and lines. So why not use uh, this kind of structure instead of a bitmap to display this button? And this applies to, to many other uh, simple icons that you can have on a, on a user interface. The other point is also linked to pixel processing, is prefer small area update. Uh, we are talking about this, this display with an internal GRAM. You cannot see uh, with, your, with your eyes when you update only uh, this area of the display. But if you start updating, uh, let's say you, you are splitted your interface, uh, this bar of buttons, this area is the number, and this bar of buttons. If you update this, and the widget is this size, you, you will see, you will see that, that uh, you are updating. The, it, you will have the curtain effect I was talking previously. 
if you split your interface, that's exactly the way it is uh, splitted, actually. Uh, this way, you will be able to update only uh, the, this part without the user noticing that you are on an entry-level MCU. Doesn't want to care about uh, about this. The user wants a nice and nice experience, a user a rich user experience. Doesn't want to know uh, how hard it was for you to to, to co connect the display and stuff like that. Wants the experience. So use small widgets. Of course, avoid movable widgets. And prefer a single screen application. So okay, Nicolas, you just told me that uh, you can uh, you could do some screen uh, screen transition for a nice uh, a nice user interface. That's true. But if you have um, let's say ten, ten screen for your application, maybe only five are required. So you will save a lot of space as well, and you will save also some screen transition. That doesn't mean that you cannot do some full screen transition in a nice way on this device. You have to use uh, adapted screen transition. And we will see that just after. But before that, I need to talk about you about the frame buffer strategy. This is the, uh, the most common case I was talking about for on, on high end and middle end uh, microcontrollers. So the MCU, the microcontrollers, uh, updates, it's not directly him, some uh, it. Sometimes you have some graphic accelerator, but Let's not talk about this for, for now. You update the frame buffer with the area that needs to be updated. And then it is sent constantly to the display, so the display gets refreshed. So this is the case where we have a full frame buffer. This is not our case on entry level MCU. So we have a, we can, we can think about another uh, frame buffer strategy, which is called the partial frame buffer. So in this case, we need a display with GRAM. That's, that's the case. So it has an internal frame buffer. But still, we have to prepare the data that will be sent to the, there will be some computation needed. For example, the circle, uh, you have to compute uh, the, the, the pixel that will be uh, drawn when drawing a circle. So they have to be prepared in RAM, but not in a full frame buffer. And in this case, we use only, this is an example of three blocks of RAM. So each block will be a few lines, maybe. This is. You can configure that. And in this case, we can render the first block. So you have to be, uh, the, your engine has to be smart enough to know that, OK, I need to, de to update, let's say, this part of the screen. But I had only, only uh, three blocks, and none, none of this block is exactly this size. So I will split the rendering into several blocks and update part of the screen. So Using first block, we be transmitted to the to the display using uh, the serial peripheral interface, and in the meantime, you can update the second block that will contain the second part of the the, the area you need to update. And in the same way, the transferring you can render the, the the next part. So this partial frame buffer allows, in fact, to update sequentially your display, and this is very important on the entry level MCU because uh, of the full screen uh, transition, mostly. Because it allows you to, to hide, in fact, the curtain effect. Using the partial frame buffer, you are able to say that, OK, my display will, anyway, when I send a full screen to my display, it will do like this, because it's slow. And it's, you have some fast SPI, but Sometimes I got some customers that have a slow SPI. I don't know why. So it is slow. But in this way, we are able to hide the fact uh, that it's always come from top to down because we are updating sequentially the display. So starting from the, the, the middle of the screen, each time drawing only one or two, maybe two lines until the display is fully refreshed. So that's the way to, let's say, hide the misery some, somehow. But at the end, it, it seems that this transition is on purpose. And you can adapt, of course, that to other uh, situations, when you add data from left to right, or blocks by blocks. You can do anything customized uh, the, the way you want, but the idea is to have a second shell update of this uh, internal buffer. And the other uh, important uh, point is to only send the area that needs to be updated. In this example, we have, we have the feeling that these two circles are rotating. 
In fact, they are not rotating at all, we are just updating the edges of each circle. This is the, um, a simulation of what is done by the rendering engine. And you, it's very clear that the, gray, the blinking gray area are only the, 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 the amount of pixels that are sent to the display uh, at a, uh, every, every tick, so every 16 milliseconds. So that's done by what we call a smart rendering engine that you have to implement. Maybe not. So, as a conclusion, uh, we can see that somehow the, the, graph on the, the advanced graphical interface are not reserved for, uh, for, for high-end uh, high uh, microcontrollers. Uh, you can think about uh, an existing product and uh, just adding a display. It's possible. You have to think about a few things, but it's still possible. And it's also possible to, have, to, to switch to another microcontroller, but not necessarily to the, to the most uh, expensive one because you need a user interface. There are some levers that can be used uh, at graphical user interface design time, so when you are selecting the object that will be displayed, and the transition and the animation, and also at graphical user interface rendering time, and that's, of course, the most important part because uh, it can get very complicated uh, to, to build a, a, a graphic engine. And that's why, fortunately, uh, so follow these basic rules, accept trade-offs. I was talking about uh, design at design time. You will, we maybe, so you have a designer team that says, OK, it will be beautiful with this, uh, this, uh, this sliding animation. When, uh, and okay, as a developer, you, you may say, that's not impossible, but let's uh, let's consider the, 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 the entire cost of our products. Uh, if you want to do that, we will have, have to add some external memory. We have, and maybe we will not fit, and uh, the customer will not be ready to pay uh, that much uh, more uh, for just uh, an advanced user interface. So you can reduce and adapt, uh, doing some trade-offs, uh, your requirements. And of course, the most important is to use the right tools. I was telling not to uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, at ST Microelectronics, we have a solution for that, which comes for free uh, on any uh, STM32 uh, microcontrollers. Uh, and it has a cutting edge graphic engine. So, what you, what you see, uh, so, sorry, what you saw the previous slide uh, with the gray, um, the gray area, blink area is in fact the simulator, uh, the PC simulator of the, uh, the TouchGFX uh, designer. So when you create an interface, uh, you create all your, the logic of it and you can simulate, emulate it on PC. And you have a specific function that will display exactly which part of the display is updated, which part of the frame buffer, sorry, is updated. So that's the non-visible part of the TouchGFX framework. The visible part is the designer. So I invite you, uh, I will invite you at the end to come to, the, to our booth, uh, meet me, and ask any question on the designer itself. So it allows you, without any specific knowledge on design, you can build an interface and, uh, and, uh, and, and test its logic uh, directly on the tool. And uh, it's completely open for customization. Of course, the graphic engine is uh, like a, not a black box, but it's delivered in binary, but all the rest, all the widgets are delivered in source code, so you can adapt it to your exact need. And it's functional on all ST evaluation kits, starting from the G0 Nucleo board, with a, a shield that uh, contains a display and, uh, and some uh, external flash as well, and uh, up to the to latest uh, STM U5 uh, discovery kit uh, that is really dedicated to, um, to graphic application and ultra low power. But in our case, in this session, the most important is that this one has 2.5 megabytes of RAM available and 4 megabytes of uh, flash available. So maybe you would say, OK, it's more expensive than uh, an H7, for example. I would say yes, but think about the entire system. In this case, uh, you do not have to add external RAM or external flash. It's all in the microcontroller. So that's where it ends for me. If you have uh, any question, I invite you first to take the microphone that is just there open to you. And if you are shy or what, you just come to our booth in uh, all 4A stand 148. 
and I will be there to answer any of your questions. Mm. 